if a state within a federal republic such as ours were to deny, as they did, citizens the right to vote because of the color of their skins, I would assume you would regard that as an example of injustice. Yes, right. Permitting federal intervention, even though it, it perhaps overwhelmed local traditions. Now, it seems to me that there is a, an easy case where one can define an example of social injustice. And to define social injustice requires a norm from which there is a departure. Hence, one aspect of social justice we could all agree on is skin color is not a, a legitimate basis on which not to vote. So my question to you, and I suppose also to, to Professor Hayek, is is, or is your skepticism about social ju justice confined to the sphere of economics? Or are you skeptical about any ability to define it? Well, I'm uh, highly skeptical when government extends its authority into areas where it uh, simply is not uh, properly qualified to, to judge and where there is no basic definition of how it should be performing. Your example, of course, refers to the political process. Obvi obviously, for the, the state to determine the conditions under which people uh, should vote uh, is an area where the state must make the rules. Now I want to elaborate on that and ask Dr. Hayek one, because I'm now going to get into the economics sphere. I'm afraid I have a lot to say on this subject, if you could start me on it. Okay. I mean, the point we must start from is that the classical demand is that the state ought to treat all people in equally, in spite of the fact that they are very unequal. Right. You can't deduce from this, the rule, that because uh, people are unequal, he ought to treat them unequally in order to make them equal. And that's what social justice amounts to. It's a demand that the state should treat the different people differently in order to place them in the same position. The rule of equal treatment applies only to things the state has to do in any case. Mm -hmm. But to make making people equal a goal of governmental policy would force government to treat people very unequally right. indeed. Let me, though, pursue an area where we get into the field of economics. In the field of politics, once again, people with access to, great, to a great deal of money are frequently said to have a, a tremendous advantage over people without money when competing for public office, given the demands. Now, if the state taxes us, or indeed as they have done in, in, in current federal income tax, gives us the opportunity to check off on our income tax forms, that we wish some of our money, $5 or $2, diverted to public financing, which is then distributed to candidates who meet equivalent standards for qualifying, so that they can be brought up to a level of equality, does this offend uh, your sense of... How are they being brought up to a level of they equality? Are being, uh, I'm, let me limit that. They are being brought up to a level of equality in the resources they may commit to the goal of getting elected. It diminishes mm -hmm. the inequality between rich and poor people to mm -hmm. buy advertising time, print speeches, attend rallies, the panoply of politics. This bothers, does, this, does this offend your sense of uh, what the government ought to be doing? Yes. You see, what you are discussing is a case where government ought to make people observe the same rules. And I'm all in favor of that. But if the different people observe the same rules, the result for them will be very different. What you are suggesting, the whole theory of social justice is suggesting, the government ought to treat the people very differently in order to put them in the same material position. That has nothing to do with the original claim for equality of the rules which government forces all people to apply. That this ideal has only been imperfectly achieved, I admit. And let's push on in the direction that government must force all people to obey the same rules. But it seems to me that in the absence of, a mit of, a, of redistribution in at least this area, mm -hmm. you are left with the uh, Anatole France's observation about the rich and poor equally being forbidden to sleep under be uh, bridges and, and beg in the park. Yes, but is that wrong? Oh, I, th well, <laughs> I think, I think it, it is the fact that it is right in some perverse sense indicates how wrong it is. I think in the field of politics, if access to political power depends on who has the greater amount of wealth, there is something indeed wrong with that. Yes, but I mean the government prohibits a great many people with great many things which only young and strong people can do and which I can no longer do. I mean if the government 
prevents me from climbing uh, some difficult peak, which 50 years ago they would love to do, it doesn't affect me because I no longer tie. It's equally a discriminating rule, but it's a general rule. Equally? Well, if we're looking for social justice, uh, let's not keep looking uh, in political places. Let's look in social places and see some examples of governmental policy directly applied there, in, in which case we get a, a very different kind of a, a set of answers. I'd like operating. to ask Mr. Buckley, in fact, uh, uh, just that kind of question. At least I think it's that kind of question. I'm sure he'll let me know if it's not. Uh, the abortion controversy. If we assume that the Supreme Court decision will stand, that is to say that the state may not limit abortions in the first three months, then do, does it offend your sense of justice, social or individual or otherwise, that we are now going to say that public money will not be available for this particular medical procedure which has been legitimated at least by the Supreme Court such that a wealthy person or a middle class person might terminate a pregnancy and a poor person may not? No, not, not in the least because it is in no way to be distinguished <coughs> from other rights protected by the Supreme Court which are enjoyed uniquely by those who have the resources to enjoy them. The Supreme Court uh, 15 years ago denied to the State Department the right to withhold a passport. Mm -hmm. This was a meaningless gesture as far as millions of Americans were concerned who simply didn't have the resources to use a passport to go to the Vienna Opera House. Uh, <clears throat> but, but nevertheless, the, uh, the, the, the finding of the Supreme Court uh, may, may or may not have been defensible. The, ap the, the notion that the discovery of a right by the Supreme Court is tantamount to the bequeathing of the means uh, is, I think, a mistake that's often made by you types. You, after what you just said, I would think there would be a little more humility about mistakes. You are saying that in any logical sense, the right to travel or to publish a newspaper or to eat caviar and drink <coughs> wine or whatever resource is functionally equivalent to the right not to be compelled to carry a fetus to term against a woman's will? Is this the precept? Is this what you have just said? Well, it, it is, it is uh, 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 everything is subject to caricature. The, uh, Who was the artist in this case? Mr. Well, Mr. Uh, Bertrand de Juvenel, in his book, The Ethics of Redistribution, said that it is the height of arrogance, and I agree with him, for anybody to presume to know what deprivations mean to individual people. For an individual who loses his uh, Mona Lisa, let us say, we are simply not in a position to say that he is less anguished than the person who has to sleep under a bridge at night. And, and, um, and I think it's very important for you to meditate that. In fact, if you want to take a few minutes off, you may. No, no, I, I <laughs> must say, I think, I think that statement ought to go absolutely unchallenged. Let it just sit there for a moment uh, for what it is. But let me ask uh, Dr. Hayek um, another question, which I think gets back to something Mr. Buckley was asking you in his more lucid uh, discussion. Uh, the Road to Serfdom, the, the, the book that most of us know you for, I think, was particularly eloquent about the, the dangers or the folly of massive and particular intervention in an administrative sense. At least that's what I, what I recall. What Mr. Buckley, I think, was asking you, what I'd like to pursue is, would a simple re redistributive policy on the part of government offend, offend you or make you as concerned as the warnings you raised about a state that was intervening specifically all throughout our lives. In other words, a simple statement, make your money how you see fit. We will take X percent of it to heal the bombs of the, heal the wounds of the poor. The is this as dangerous a policy? The answer is very definitely yes, because any redistributive policy requires a discriminating treatment of different people. You cannot, so long as you treat all the people according to the same formal rules, forcing them to act only to observe the same rule, uh, bring about any distribution of incomes. Once you decide that government is entitled to take from some people in order to give it to others, this is automatically discrimination of a kind for which there can be no general rule. They are purely arbitrary. 
why isn't the general rule all those in class A, twenty to thirty thousand dollars a year, pay X, all those in class B pay Y, all those in class C receive X? Why is it not a, a general rule as opposed to the well, it depends growth of because X doesn't equal Y. The very <laughs> difficult question how to define a general rule. I mean, after long discussion in jurisprudence, it has come out that the essential point about the general rule is that you cannot predict who will profit from it and who will suffer from it. Any rule where you know beforehand who will be the gainers and who will be the sufferers is, in that sense, not a general rule. But now, does this fact that it is not a general rule make it nonetheless inadvisable? Inadvisable because once you authorize government to act arbitrarily, there's no limit to it. Now, w uh, I, I think we, I want to make sure I understand this. The word arbitrary all of a sudden came in there. Why is it arbitrary not if one understands Not acting according to a rule is arbitrary. Hmm? I'm sorry? Not acting according to a general rule is arbitrary. It's the only way in which you can define arbitrary. I don't see why, if one understands exactly the premises on which one is making distinctions, why is it arbitrary? I distinguish between rich and poor when I tax them because rich people have more discretionary income. Well, it's, uh, you, you distinguish between the people whom you want to have more and the people whom you want to have less. But why is it arbitrary? I've given you what I, what I think at least is a plausible and defensible reason for distinguishing well, among them. Well, the distinction is between, I can only say, a general uh, rule which applies equally to all and a rule which distinguishes between different groups. Arbitrary does not need necessarily mean <laughs> thoughtless. Yes, I, I understand, That's correct, I understand that mm -hmm. part, but it seems to me that one is moving from a descriptive to a normative yeah, judgment yeah. Uh, in an effort to, to set forth a rule which will make it impossible for government to treat different people differently. Yeah. Uh, let me come up with perhaps a suitable example. If you went back to an earlier time in American history, the goal, always imperfectly realized, was that the blindfolded goddess of justice stood before us all dispensing her favors equally uh, to all who came before her. If you take various governmental programs of arbitrarily conceived, uh, as Professor Hayek is using the word, take affirmative action in our time. Now we have a law which says, uh, come before the blindfolded goddess of justice, but now she's encouraged to peek, and she says, first tell me your color, tell me your sex, and then I will tell you how we are going to treat you. Uh, well, now, you know, there are Lithuanian minorities as, as well as uh, uh, black or whatever. The only majority in this country that I know of, of course, is, uh, are women. There are more women than men. But every other grouping, ethnic or otherwise, into which we can break ourselves turns out to be a series of minority relationships. But and it is highly arbitrary to select some of those to say, these are the people uh, whom we single out for special Just treatment, quickly, and these are the people whom we penalize. There's only been one minority in American history that I know of that was legally enslaved. Yes, and it was a legal process which made that possible. Yeah. The, the enslavement came as the direct result of the state determining the affairs of men. It was arbitrary. Yes. But would you accept but that uh, all I, your I'm terribly sorry, Dr. Hayek, but we have to say good night. Thank you very much, and thank you, Mr. Roach, <laughs> and thank you very much, Mr. Greenfield, and thank you, ladies <laughs> from the Sacred Heart at Yonkers. Printed bound transcript of this program, send $1 to Firing Line, Post Office Box 5966, Columbia, South Carolina, 29250. Indicate the subject of the program and please allow three weeks for delivery. This program was produced by SICA, which is solely responsible for its content. Funding was provided by this station and by other public television stations. Thank <laughs> you.